welcome to Brain Chat. I'm Dr. Mitzi Joy Williams, your board certified neurologist and MS specialist. And my mission is to engage, educate, and empower those affected by MS to become an active part of their healthcare team. Here on Brain Chat, we'll be discussing all things MS, health and wellness, advocacy, and we'll even throw a little bit of music and music therapy in there as well. Thank you so much for joining us and stay tuned for the next episode. Hello and welcome to Brain Chat. Happy Monday, everybody. It has been a couple of weeks and I have missed you guys. Um, I am very excited to be back with you tonight, um, you know, to educate and raise awareness about MS. And we have got a great topic for you all tonight. We are bringing it home to the fellas. So we are talking about men and MS. And I am very excited about the special guests that I have with me tonight. For those of you who are new to Brain Chat or for those who are Brain Chat uh, regulars, you know how we do. Type in the chat where you are logging in from. I'd love to hear where you guys are coming from. Sometimes we get um, friends from the UK. Sometimes we get some other friends from overseas. Sometimes I get some neighbors here um, in Georgia as as well as all across the U.S. So just let us know where you're logging in from. Um, and we also want to thank our sponsor, the National Mess Society, for sponsoring the podcast. Well, as I said, I just came back from an action-packed meeting um, at the Consortium of MS Centers where we had so many updates about multiple sclerosis, about the course of MS, about treatments. And so we're going to do another uh, topic later on this year where we talk about some of those updates. But Tonight, as part of our uh, first part of our sizzling summer series, uh, we've got MS for the fellas. So first want to introduce Dr. Stephen Krieger, who is um, a professor of neurology at Mount Sinai. And he also um, practices in the uh, uh, comprehensive MS center there. Um, we have uh, Stuart Schlossman, who is a patient advocate and is the creator of MS Views and News. And we have the amazing Tyler Campbell, um, who is an MS advocate um, and is an author, um, as well as an amazing speaker. So let me bring them up into Brain Chat. Welcome to Brain Chat, my friends. How you doing? How you doing? I'm doing good. Doing? It's so good to see you guys. Hey, I see you as well. For the fellas. Okay, awesome. Well, I am very excited. This is the first time I've done this topic, you know, and so I do treat a lot of men with MS um, and certainly have heard their experiences, but love to hear things directly, um, you know, from those people who are part of the MS community. And, you know, I'm very excited about, you know, you guys sharing your experience and also sharing some tips for how the fellas can advocate for themselves um, and deal with some of the concerns that may be unique to men with MS. And it's very interesting because MS is one of the the few diseases where men actually are an underrepresented group. Um, usually when we think of underrepresented groups, we think of maybe people who live in rural communities, we think of minoritized populations, but in MS, you know, it's much less affected by men. Um, and there's some studies that suggest that some of the outcomes may be a little bit more severe. So I'm really excited about this topic and really excited uh, for you guys to speak to the folks today and, uh, and give them some inspiration. So why don't we first start with a little bit of a round robin and tell us about yourself and how you, you know, were introduced to the MS community. Why don't we start with Dr. Krieger, and then I'll go to you, Stuart, and then I'll go with you, Tyler. All right. Well, Dr. Williams, thank you for having me back, and it's a pleasure to join uh, these two gentlemen here to talk about this topic. So I'm an MS specialist neurologist in New York. I uh, work at Mount Sinai, and you know, uh, Dr. Williams, I think you and I came up at about exactly the same time uh, training in our fellowships. I mean, not to put an age to us, but about 15, 16 years ago now, mm -hmm. that was when I joined the MS community as a uh, MS specialist neurologist. And, uh, you know, as you said, MS is a diverse condition and it can affect everyone. And I think part of the, the move in MS education over these last few years is to bring awareness to folks that don't necessarily fit the old school textbook profile of what MS looks like. And as you said, right. the minoritized populations, people of color, and men who are not the paradigm. We used to think MS was just a white woman's disease, and mm -hmm. that is not true in any respect. 
And so I think, you know, trying to bring awareness so that people get diagnosed earlier, treated promptly, and can advocate for themselves as men in a not typically male disease, I think is an important thing. And I'm really glad you're devoting time in your program to it. So I'll stop there. Turn it over awesome. to my, my Awesome. Lay it on us, Stuart. Lay it on, lay it on. So I too am an, am an MS specialist, but I'm an MS specialist patient. All right. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to uh, stand for the person that told me that I had MS back in 1998. And he told me I would not be walking in 10 years. And I said, that's a big no-no to say to me. So I made sure that I got a very aggressive doctor and I bowed away to the one that diagnosed me who did not want to treat because at the time he said that treatments were far worse than, mm. than what I was living with. So I went and I found one doctor and then that doctor put me on a medication and then I was having too many relapses still. So I found another doctor who would treat me a little bit better. And he put me on dual therapy with two different medications. And I thought that was fabulous because this guy was going to make sure that I was going to continue walking. And so uh, the beat went on, you know, where um, I am still walking. And that was 26 years ago. And, um, and I've got a lot to discuss with you all. So just lay it on and let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to the little fellas. I can't wait to talk. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> all right, Tyler. I got one question real quick, Missy. Did, did Dr. Yeah. Craig have a full head of hair at that time and y'all's fellowship? I mean, we were talking yeah, about hairstyles like earlier. Never, Has he always like been never. consistent? Yeah, yeah when, I, when I joined the MS community, I looked a little bit younger. I'm not gonna Come lie. On. No. He had a few well, less I, wrinkles, but the hair wasn't there. The hair, the hair wasn't there. <laughs> he looked good to me. Uh, listen, Tyler Campbell uh, diagnosed with MS back in 2007 at the tender, ripe age of 21. Um, mm -hmm. As a black male, my first introduction with this diagnosis, I did not find anyone who looked like. Um, I saw Montel Williams about uh, four months later over the internet. Uh, and that was the closest, you know, black man that I saw with the disease. Uh, and from then on, you just kind of think, well, dang, something's wrong with me. If, like Doc said, this is largely a white woman's disease, then why me? How me? And it must be an even bigger problem if it is me. And so since that moment in 2007, flash forward into now, I'm 36 years old, and life has been about leaving things better than the way that you found them. And from a male standpoint, it is about navigating my life in such a way where I've confronted things that I am nervous about, scared about, um, my shyest moments with MS, being able to dive in deep to those, address those, so I can be comfortable speaking about those and giving people my ups and downs, my truths, but more important solutions um, to help especially men know that you're not alone with what you're going through. And it's not just you, but there are solutions and there is support. And so that's been my, my advocacy role, my speaking role ever since. I love it. I love it. So before we get into a little bit of the nitty gritty of the details, let's kind of take a 50,000 foot view and start with you, um, Dr. Krieger. Tell us a little bit about are there characteristics of MS that are unique to men or are there differences that we see um, in the male population versus the female population? Yeah. So uh, great question. MS is a very variable condition. So no two people with MS have quite the same story. It's what makes it a challenge for us on the clinician side of things. I think it makes it a challenge on the lived experience side of things, not knowing what to expect and not knowing how it's going to go, not knowing, you know, Tyler, you said you looked to certain role models, people who resembled you in some way, but maybe didn't resemble you in the way their disease went. And so it's a little bit hard to predict in that way. Um, but thinking about populations of people, in general, men with MS, as I think Tyler, you said, can have a rougher time of it, can have a worse time of it. Not everyone, but if you look at the populations, people who are men with MS are a little bit more likely to have weakness, to have trouble walking, to have progression than women. Now we can wonder about the reasons behind that. I have some thoughts on it, maybe we'll get to it. But that is one of the things when I take care of a man with MS, I'm a little bit extra worried about how he's gonna do. 
And, you know, to your point about being black with MS, as Dr. Williams, you've done a lot of the scholarship on this topic, but we also know that people who are black with MS may have a tendency to have a worse outcome, have a rougher time with this condition than folks who are not. And so when I see a black man with MS, I level with him as best I can that I have concerns right from day one. We're going to target the best possible outcome. We're going to do what we need to do. But I want to be honest about my concern up front. Not, not tell him, Stuart, what someone told you. You're not going to walk in 10 years. But I put the mm -hmm. enemy out there to say this is what we're up against. And then what can we do about that? So that's some of the things we think about on, the I think, the clinician side, the, the mm -hmm. provider side when we see some, yeah. a man with MS. Um, but no two people are the same. And I'm curious to hear how both of your stories evolved. Absolutely. And so for Stuart and Tyler, you know, you all are amazing patient advocates. Stuart, you have MS Views and News. You provide uh, in-person and online education for the broader MS community. And Tyler, you have a radio show. Are there things that you all have heard from, you know, uh, other men in the MS community that seem to be more frequent or occur more frequently than what, you know, maybe some of the women that are part of your programs um, may experience? Tyler, you want to go first? No, oh, go ahead, Stu. You haven't came to the light, the microphone and blessed us yet, baby. Give me something. Give me something. No, no, no. See, I, I, I go off of what you – no, I'll, I'll get started. Anyway, Tyler's got more to talk about because he's got more odds against him. So that's why he, he, he outlasts all of us. All right, so, you know, what I have found is that um, for many men, because there are so few – more few of us, I guess that's the correct words to say – with mm -hmm. multiple sclerosis, that it is harder for us to engage mm. or harder to get the men involved because they're afraid to, number one, show that they have been weakened in some way. And not only that, they have less people to speak with about this. If you mm. show up at many of the self-help groups, you find predominantly, obviously, the room filled with women and maybe just two or three men out of 30 in the group that, uh, and that would be the, the one third um, and, and it's just very difficult to speak. So then if they have a guest speaker there to speak about, say, sexual issues, the guy doesn't want to talk, you know, so he doesn't want to bring out that he's, uh, uh, he's got ED or he's got, or he's got lack of feeling in his body to be able to, you know, feel the good sensations of, of, of a very good, you know, uh, warm relationship. Um, for the women, of course, it's a lot easier for them to speak all the time. I mean, this is just a male thing. Also, you know, guys, um, they feel like if they're um, not able to work anymore, you know, this mm -hmm. is something that, you know, we grew up, I grew up in a society where the men were the breadwinners, all right? And um, it makes it hard for us to say that we're not going to be able to provide for our families. So it makes it a little bit more challenging um, from that aspect to then say, you know, I can't work anymore. And that's why I said, for me, that it's never going to get to that point. I will not be that person that sits on the couch waiting for a cure. I'm going to get out there and I'm going to, going to help try to make a difference. Tyler. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it, Stu. I love it, man. If we was in, if we was in a little poetry club, I'd be snapping my fingers just like this for you, brother. That's because um, I Stu, is, Stu is right. And so I'm going to pick up what you just put down, my brother. Okay. And, and, for, for many of us as men, we know this, even before MS comes walking in our lives. As a child, you fall, you bump your head, you cry. You're told, don't cry. You're not supposed to cry. So your wounds in manhood actually start in early on in your life of what you're not supposed to do from a masculinity standpoint. So you're already behind the curve of sharing your emotions. And if you look at middle-aged men, you know, if we're talking and crossing over into the MS sector, a lot of times, middle-aged men, we are statistically some of the loneliest creatures on the face of this earth because we don't know or never went through the process of learning how to express ourselves. That's and right. that piggybacks off of what Stuart was saying. So then I understand why Dr. Crager is saying what he's saying, why he kind of has his antennas up and radars up when he's looking at the charts of what his incoming patient is, male, female, and he knows He's got his spider senses up when a male walks through because there's a battle there. And so there are unaddressed wounds that we bring on forth even before MS comes into our lives. Mm -hmm. And then you really have to dial a 911 with trying to address those things because a man is about to go through so much more with this disease 
because of what he hasn't already dealt with. And so a big part of tonight is making things okay um, mm-hmm. for man, because that's what we need more of, the ability to let your heart show. Because up until this point, your heart has been told that there's no room for that in the building. Mm-hmm. And so if we can get to a place where men can frequently come to a space of not feeling judged, uh, not feeling ridiculed, not feeling less than, and hearing from other men who have what you have, that it's okay and you are not alone, then perhaps we can help eliminate so many other stressors, which lead to, to further exacerbations. We know this and what stress does to us. Um, that we can help limit those things so you can actually get on the road of really combating the disease, but you can't combat it without, you know, dealing with wounds that you have of yourself, of a man that we need to free you from today. Mm -hmm. Can Can I feed off of that for a moment? Absolutely. Go ahead. So further along from what Tyler is saying is that, you know, there's that level of frustration All right. So a man is having a bad day. All right. And now he can't even really express it to anybody either. So what does he do? I mean, um, you know, they they tend to, um, you know, that's where I think we're getting a lot of the uh, depression from. And and that just gets worse and worse. And there is nobody there for that person to actually speak with unless he's got a spouse that he feels he can speak with. Um, And and just as the the. Or, or a male support group, you know, there are lack of them around as well. So who does he talk to? What happens? Right. And so let's pause right here and you guys are getting into it, but I want to dig into this a little bit deeper. Let's talk about the psychological impact of a diagnosis like multiple sclerosis um, on, you know, men who are diagnosed as well as their families. I was listening to Michelle Obama's last audio book and she gave kind of a very candid Um, you know, description of what happened when her father was diagnosed with MS. And it made me think about it in a little bit of a different lens. So she talked not just about the disability that he experienced and, you know, difficulty working, et cetera, but she talked about the impact on her family. Like, because he had more disability, there were times where maybe they didn't feel as safe, you know, like if something happened, would he be able to jump in and help them? And so let's talk a little bit more about that psychological impact and how people can deal with that. Because I think that, you know, as you all have said, oftentimes, you know, my male patients don't talk about it. Now, people talk to me about all kinds of stuff because I just kind of pull that kind of, for some reason, people just talk to me about stuff. So my, my <laughs> fellas are, are often open, <laughs> but But, you know, in many settings, people don't feel comfortable talking about it. But, you know, oftentimes when they hear other men, you know, talking about things like depression or talking about therapy or talking about coping mechanisms, it will encourage them, you know, to know that it's okay to seek some of those resources. So let's talk about how how that, you know, how that impact, um, you know, how that impacted you all and how we can deal with it or how we can encourage, you know, those in the audience to to deal with those um, psychological um, difficulties. I love it. I love it. I love it. Listen, to not know is no longer an excuse to not find out. Mm-hmm. And I think the beautiful thing about us as men dealing with this right now, as opposed to a lot of the baby baby boomer generation or people who were diagnosed with this disease so early on without information. We live in an information age. So now if I don't see a man in my support group, or if I don't see or know any man, when I walk out of that doctor's office, Mitzi, you know what I can do? I can go find a podcast. I can go find articles. I can find testimonials. I can find sources of men who are living with depression and speaking about it. I can build my own team of people who I may not have ever met, but people whose stories I can gravitate to and say, oh my gosh, I've got that, or I've heard that, or he's dealt with that. I can build that. There are books, there's information now. And so what you're yearning for, what you are hurting from, what you are scorned from, what you feel alone from, the beautiful thing about it now is we have information Hmm. and we can go find it and you can build a team. that's the, 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 the first thing that I want to put out there is they might not be in your neighborhood or in your, your support group or at the clinician's office or amongst your, your, where you gather, where men gather, where that is. But you can find people who are openly speaking about those things. Stu, Doc, 
you guys go ahead. I just feel like we have the ability to build our own team. You do. Thank you. I'm not going to sing my answer like you do so well, but I'm going to just let them know. It does right? sound like he's singing, doesn't it? It does. I like it? He's very melodic about the whole words. thing. The way he, his, his jive into it all is just everybody wants to listen to that. All <laughs> You're right. Mesmerized. So when, when I was diagnosed, um, I was extremely frustrated. I was extremely angry with everything. I didn't know if I wanted to put me and my car in a canal or if I wanted to, how I was going to fight this thing. I didn't know who to speak with. I didn't have anybody. Like I said, when I walked into a support group meeting, firstly, it was mainly all women. Secondly, everybody was in a motorized piece of equipment. And I was the only one that walked in there. And I felt like, wow, you know, what's going to happen to me? Um, and that's when I got... I turned my anger around and I said, you know, there are people that are attending these support groups and they have no idea what's actually wrong with them. And that's what I wanted to create. I wanted to be able, there wasn't much internet back then. All right. But I was on the internet and I was internet savvy and I would get on and I would find out what people from these different support groups needed to learn for themselves. And I went on the internet and I found the information and I came back to the support group meeting or I got their email address and I sent them the information. And a little by little, it started building up a little bit more. So that way I was starting to send out information like every day to several, you know, 10, 20, 30 people. And I said, you know, that's crazy. I might as well put a name to this at the same time. And we called it Stu's Views and MSN. I remember. I remember <laughs> Stu's Views. I used to that? get the newsletter. I used that's to get right. the newsletter. That's right. So that started way back then. This was back in uh, 98, 90. This was in 99 because I was diagnosed in December 98. So, um, so, you know, I wanted to be able to help people find the information that they could not find. I became the resource for them. All right. This was at that age where people were afraid to go on the internet because, oh my God, they were, somebody was going to take all their information away from them. They were going to steal their money. They were going to take their houses and and, and they would just learn all about their lives that they didn't want to let everybody know about. So, yes, I started providing this information. And, uh, you know, the challenges that were met were the challenges that I felt I had to um, alleviate for people. And in doing so, it made me feel better about myself and mm -hmm. having multiple sclerosis and wanting to do that much more. And I'm sure as we get on in tonight's program, you all will find out about it. All right. Talk to us, Dr. Krieger. Tell us what you're seeing in the clinic and what you're seeing um, when you're treating your fellas uh, in the clinic. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things is what you guys are talking about. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, I think you froze on uh -oh. us a little bit. Man, and I know Doc got some heat coming. I can tell I my know it. Hands. I know. Okay, there it is. start over for us. Start there over. You go, Doc. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we All can right. hear you now. I was going to say, like, what you guys are talking about is getting information out there, people seeking information, people being in support groups, people looking at the Internet. But both of you were obviously both very motivated people. And I think what sometimes happens, perhaps more often to men, is they just shut down. That's right. They don't even want to engage. And... First of all, they may be very skeptical of the MS diagnosis, and I don't blame them. You know, I think people should be skeptical. They should make sure that things are being done right. But, you know, I think if I had to generalize, I would say sometimes women with MS are like coming from a place of, you know, why is this happening to me? And men come from a place of, I don't think this is happening to me. Like this is this isn't really happening. Right. This isn't right. I'm not really here. This isn't really me. And there's this hurdle that you have to get people over to be able to say, look, it's real, but we're doing something about it and then have them feel motivated to seek information. I think men maybe more often put up walls and don't want to look. And so trying to draw them out and get people to be comfortable and understand that there is good information out there and there are people to learn from, like both of you and others, you know, who I think have done a really good job of being a voice for MS, particularly for men, you know, Damien Washington, others who are like very visible. Um, I think that really helps. But there's that first hurdle, that sense of like darkness and, and distance that I think sometimes happens, you know, and, and Stuart, you said it, you, uh, you felt angry, right? And, and that anger, is the way a lot of men express frustration. 
It's a way a lot of men express feeling powerless, feeling like they can't do something. That's right. And so it's mm -hmm. about restoring that sense of power to them, showing them, to use a comment that's coming up in the chat, showing them that there are ways that we can fix things. Yeah, I was just going to say. Get agency back. I think that's a really important thing for all, everyone with MS, but perhaps a little bit more so for men. Okay. Yeah. And I love that what you said about agency and there is a comment that says men feel like they have to fix it, but can't see how to. Um, and I definitely can recognize that in my, in my male patients. And one of the things that you said, Stuart, I think really stood out about your experience. You know, you talked about the fact that you went to the first doctor and they told you basically there was nothing you could do. And you were like, I'm not accepting that answer. And then you went to the next one. Right. And there was, you know, a treatment plan, but you still were getting worse. And so you said, well, this isn't working. And so you sought another opinion. And so I think that part of the agency is making sure that you create a team of folks that you feel comfortable with. Right. So there are some patients, you know, um, that feel very comfortable with me. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. You know, I'm sure that Dr. Krieger could say the same. Right. And so I encourage everyone to find some someone that you feel comfortable with, that you can talk to, um, that you can express your concerns with, because, you know, you can't really live well with MS if you're not able to talk to your team about what's going on with you so that we can address it. Um, and as we're talking about things that are going on with you that sometimes may seem a little bit embarrassing to talk about, let's talk about sexual dysfunction. We know this is one of Tyler's favorite topics. Mm -hmm. Tyler likes to talk about sex. So let's <laughs> talk about <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why so get to the good stuff. stuff. Missy, get to, the, get to stuff. the good stuff. All right, because I got another topic focused solely on sex, but this is for the fellas. All right, so let's talk about that because that's a big one, right? For men, um, and something that people are often embarrassed to talk about, don't want to discuss, um, but certainly affects um, everyday function can affect mood, depression, all of those things. So, so let's talk about it. So how, so we'll start with you with a more clinical side, uh, Dr. Krieger, right? So what happens or how does MS cause sexual dysfunction in men? So the first thing I would say is I try to make the idea of sexual dysfunction as easy to talk about as possible by taking stigma away from it, taking the idea of, you know, manhood and virility and these ideas just out of it and making it very biological, you know, if someone wouldn't be ashamed to say that their leg feels numb or they wouldn't be ashamed to say that, you know, their foot was a little clumsy, why should they be ashamed to say that the signals weren't working quite right in that respect either? And that's how I tend to put it. MS interrupts the messages. Mm -hmm. The brain is telling a part of the body what to do and the body doesn't always hear that message. And the, you know, sensation and sensory experiences are coming up into the brain and sometimes those signals don't 100% get through either. And without the signals coming down for control and without the sensory information coming up to the brain for feeling, it makes perfect sense that there could be erectile dysfunction, sexual dysfunction as well. So I just try to make it a mechanical issue. And how can we then address that mechanical issue? So for me, the first aspect of it is just being able to talk about it like any other symptom, something we can do something about. Absolutely. And when we think about, you know, there is the mechanical issue, um, but, you know, there also are, you know, other issues. There can be secondary sexual dysfunction. If you have certain symptoms like spasticity or weakness, positions may be difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you have different thoughts about body image, that usually applies a little bit more for the women than the men, but that can also affect, you know, your libido. So, and then some of the medications we give you for other stuff can cause problems, you know? So I think number one is recognize it's not your fault, um, you know, that there are many dif different factors that can play into it, um, but ultimately that those signals are interrupted and it is a biological issue um, in most cases. What do you all think about it or uh, what would you all like to say about it for Stuart and- uh, Well. I'm going to go first because I know Tyler's got a lot to talk about this. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, I've got the strong blood flow. I've always had it. All right. Um, I always thought I was a lucky little guy, um, you know, being able to last forever. All right. When in fact was I didn't feel enough. And although I can, I had no problem with ED, I could never feel enough to reach completion. Mm -hmm. And that, and that, you know, way back when was extremely frustrating. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But then I just learned to turn that awa- around and say, as long as I satisfy her, then I'm great and I'm good. All right. So, um, you know, it's um, it's twofold. But yes, the spasticity does take effect. The cramps do, do take effect. Um, and, and, you know, it changes the, the rhythm, so to speak. Um, and, um, you know, you have to take a break or whatever. That's fine, too. I mean, as long as your your partner is is understandable about everything, then it, then everything works. I mean, mm-hmm. you could have a great time. You could have a wonderful romantic evening and you could have a wonderful time later on, wherever it be in the car, on the couch, in bed or or whatever. You could have a really great, fun time as long as you're with somebody that you want to be with. Um, and, and again, it's just, um, it's making it work. That makes it more enjoyable one way or the other. Thank you. For I love that, Stu. I think, I think, um, it, it's all, everything is very aligned with what both doctors, Stuart, have been talking about. The, the essence of communication. Right. Um, it, it is a healing agent that is completely free to everybody. And, and your willingness to speak openly, number one, to your doctor about what you are feeling, getting comfortable in that arena is is very big. Um, and then in your relationships, uh, the ability to express what is taking place with you and not feeling like you have to hide it. I, I admire that so much about women because they are excellent communicators. And actually, as men, we love it when they can make us Uh, aware of some of their most vulnerable states. Um, You feel empowered uh, to try to take care of those moments. So imagine the amount of things you can pour back into your spouse and that person in their relationship where you can come from a heartfelt space of what you are experiencing below the belt. And, And for me, and then it's about being creative. Right. I think we all get to different ages. And like Stuart was saying, there's things that we do in our 20s, whatever, that hey, you're in your 30s. They're not the same. And and that happens MS or not. So don't feel bad about that. We're just addressing it a little bit earlier or maybe sooner than what you thought. But what about learning what blood flow is, educating yourself? How do you help your blood flow between communication with you and your spouse with different positions? that aren't necessarily um, coming about if you don't communicate and express those things. So I can't tell you the amount of things that my wife has helped me with. And remember, I'm getting to a place of comfort uh, with my erectile dysfunction. I'm 12 years married. There are things we're talking about now that I was not doing when I was 24 and married, okay? So I don't want people to think that it came. It came as a natural, slow progression of being able to open up. And once I learned to open up with my wife, she helped soothe and comfort me within the bedroom and and that it was a teamwork project that yeah you have this going on but there are different ways that i need to be pleased as a woman that we can aid those things with what you are dealing with as a man and pressure became lifted and you notice that when you're tightly wound about your erectile dysfunction with with pressure because you're worried 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 um it's not helping your performance one bit and all the solutions that we're coming up with, they're getting thrown out the window because you're not comfortable. Um, so the essence of communication, I, I can't say how huge that is. And to not be ashamed, because like Stuart used to tell me, he used to say, Tyler, you just hit it a little bit earlier, but we all have to have a conversation about erectile dysfunction sooner or later as a man anyway. So what's, what's the big deal? You're going to have to have the combo. You just got to have it a little bit early. I just want to add, you know, I think my description of, oh, this is just biology to try to make it more mechanical is a way to try to help people be more comfortable with it, to take away some of those those layers. But some of the points you guys raised about communication, about having a partner that you can be with and be comfortable with, I try to facilitate that if I can have the partner in the room when we talk about it. I think it makes it easier because then they don't feel like the erectile dysfunction is a reflection of their interest in them. Mm-hmm. They don't feel like it's a reflection of the relationship. It just becomes about a symptom, takes some of that pressure off of the partner and allows that partner to be part of the solution and part of the collaborator with the man with MS to try to, you know, make sure that everything is satisfying for both for both partners, for, for both parties. So anyway, it's just another way of trying to bring that person in on it. Absolutely. I, I think those um 
partner conversations are extremely important. And I think for me, you know, as we do when we talk about mental health sy- sy- symptoms and normalizing it, you know, I try to normalize it in a way like, listen, you know, I see people who talk to me about this all the time. Like you are not the first person. Let's get into it. What is the problem? Is, it, is uh, it, you know, can we not start? Can we not finish? Is the leg hurting? I mean, what's going on, right? And so I think that we have to normalize these conversations. For you, Stuart and Tyler, was it difficult, you know, to bring up these types of things in your healthcare appointment? Or what tips would you give people to bring up these types of topics that can be very sen- sen- uh, sensitive? Go ahead, Stu. So before before I answer that, mm-hmm. Dr. Williams, I want to ask you, if sure. you get a male patient come in and are they easily able to discuss this with you or is it something? What's that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So we talk about sex all the time. Matter of fact, people sometimes give me a little bit more detail. <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay I get it. I get it. I get that, it. That would, okay. be, that would be Tyler. I'm, I got I'm very it. imaginative. So let's yeah. not, you know, let's not get my imagination going too much. Um, but I, you know, I try to normalize it like everything else, right? You know, are you having leg cramps? Are you having sexual dysfunction? Are you having, I mean, it's, it's a list among many, um, but I want people to feel comfortable, um, you know, my guys often do feel comfortable talking to me. Sometimes they'll come in and they'll be with their partner and the partner will bring it up. And then that will open up a discussion, you know. So um, however we talk about it, I try to make people feel comfortable and know that this is a part of the condition, but also that there are things we can do about it, you know. And we definitely don't want this, you know, severely affecting your lifestyle and we don't even know about it to be able to try to offer solutions to fix it. So, so, go, so going back, sorry about that. So going back to what you were asking me, um, you know, I've brought it up to my neurologist or neuro- other neurologists and everybody says, most of the time they say, maybe you should speak to a urologist. And then the urologist says to me, there's Stuart, there's nothing we could do for that. I mean, there's no medicine to make your, make your numbness. It's, it's not, it's not erectile dysfunction. Mm-hmm. It's just lack of feeling. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I mean, it could be used all night and it's not going to get to the point where we want it to get hardly, I should say. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it's but there's no medicine for it. Mm -hmm. And there's you know, although they say, well, what about toys? Well, what about toys? There's still no feeling there. Mm -hmm. No. So it doesn't Mm -hmm. really matter what you use. And if if it's one of those days, I mean, there are days that there is some feeling, but there most of the time there's no feeling. And so what do you do with it? Literally, what do you do with it? So, I, you know, if I can pop in with a clinical thought or two, I know we're not, you know, doing a patient visit right now, but I, what I would say is if someone has erectile dysfunction, obviously there are plenty of medicines right. that have been marketed since the 90s to help with erectile dysfunction. But if the problem is sensitivity, then there are ways of trying to increase sensitivity in the region by, for instance, using stimulating gels and creams. Mm-hmm using capsaicin type stimulants that can add a lot of sensation. This is where a lot of like jellies that have kind of a menthol quality or others can be useful because they just enhance sensation and they can make people feel things that they otherwise might not feel. Plus other stuff, toys, et cetera. Um, But just to start with that, that, you know, often sometimes for men who finish too soon, the goal is to try to numb the area for someone who, has trouble finishing because of numbness from MS or from other neurological conditions, the goal is to increase the stimulation. And some of these things you can put on the skin and on the area can be helpful. All been tried. And all I continue to say is dead wood. Uh, (laughs) Well, you know, I I mean, so, so, you know, so certainly, you know, in a perfect world, we would be able to, you know, offer solutions for, every individual person, but we know each person is different. Um, And there are some symptoms, unfortunately, numbness is one of those symptoms that's very difficult Mm -hmm. for us to do anything about, right? If you've got the tinglys, if it's burning, you know, any of those things, if it's creepy crawly, we can a lot of times fix that. Um, But if it's lack um, of sensation, sometimes it's not as easy to fix. Um, yep. But certainly, hey, things have really progressed because I remember when I first started practicing, we would talk about getting a 
frozen bag of blueberries and putting some blueberries, some cold back there. So there weren't all these oh gels and things to talk about. We were talking about blueberries. So, you know, yep. so as things continue to, you know, um, progress, hopefully, you know, we'll have some better solutions. So yeah, um, a couple, a, I'm sorry, were you going to say something else? Oh, no, I said that's good. Yeah. So, so a couple of other things kind of, cause we're getting close to time here um, that we want to talk about. Um, how can the broader MS community better support men with MS? That's, that's for you, Stuart, and for you, Todd. Well, that's great because I'm just going to say that um, people have to understand that men also struggle. Hmm. Okay. That we have, the same problems that most women do. We just don't talk about it like women mm. do. Um, and again, it's just cloaked. And if we don't have the doctor that we can actually speak with instead of the doctor, you know, rushing through the notes because they have their 15 minutes and they want to get you in and out as quick as possible, then it becomes even more difficult to speak about because maybe that you're saving this for the last thing to talk about when maybe it should have been the first thing that's asked, you know, what struggles you most What's bothering you most, you know, when you walk in that door rather than give me the list? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's huge. I, I think it's it's just there's more creative platforms for these intimate discussions, mm -hmm. right? Because there's going to be more that's coming in that direction, you know, for that male for what has already been previously laid in their life. I can't express how much those wounds and all that other stuff. Um, but I, that, that's it. I just, the, the willingness to open up and have more visibility for conversations like this that are more inclined to be held behind closed doors, which I don't understand because if it's held behind closed door, how can it help anybody? Right. And how does it make any male feel comfortable about what he is dealing with, with MS? Um, by keeping it close to the vest. Um, so with, with media outlets, with the, the, the various organizations, with, with everybody who's out there, don't be afraid to touch on the sensitive topic. Don't be afraid to go after the mindfulness. Don't be afraid to go after the depression. Don't skew yourself into thinking um, that's more emotional. That's a woman's side. I think I'm more emotional than my wife. She just do a better job of talking about it. There it is. That's what I said. <laughs> That's what Stuart is saying. Like, I, if 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 for here, here's what it is, and I'll, I'll get off the, the soapbox. I want to help men to understand that most of the time, fellas, we're actually more emotional than our counterparts. Um, we just keep it. That's right. But we, a lot of times, most of the time, we're actually more. more doesn't make you more or less or more or less than them. It's like it. It is what it is. And what makes it unhealthy is we don't have the space. And so mm -hmm. please, more, more platforms, create spaces for conversations like this. And, and don't be afraid to touch on those more sensitive topics because that's what we need more of. And I think also it's important to recognize that sometimes, um, and I see it a little bit more in my my men patients than my women, you know, that those emotions can manifest themselves in other ways, like irritation, um, being angry, right? So it's important to recognize when something is different, you know, and that even though you may think, you know, everybody's just irritating you, getting on your nerves, it may be some underlying anxiety or depression or difficulty, you know, dealing with diagnosis. Um, and that's just coming out in a different form because it's not as acceptable for men, you know, generally to cry like women, you know, so women may cry, um, but men may get irritated, you know, so, you know, recognizing that um, I think is extremely important as well. Hey, um, call, call them he motions. Bitsy, we can he even give them a different name. We don't right. have to say Whatever emotion because that might be sensitive. Call them he motions. Let's just okay. throw I, that I out like there. that. He motions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so what tips would you all give, you know, for Stuart and Tyler, you know, to other men out there? Are there resources that are available? I often, um, when I have newly diagnosed men come to my clinic, I often direct them to you guys, right? You know, because you're out there, you're expressing things about your MS experience. You are raising awareness and educating those um, in the community. I also talk about Damien a lot as well. How, what, what advice would you give or, or are there resources you would direct people to um, who are newly diagnosed or men who maybe have been diagnosed for a while and just haven't found their tribe or their community, so to speak? Sure. Well, I try to tell everybody to keep as busy as you can and not live your MS. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Okay, make your MS live with you, all right? Uh, life is too short. And um, we have to try to do as many things as we can do while we can do them, right? So if you go about your day and you want to go play golf, then go play golf. You want to hit a few tennis balls, do that. If you're able to do, even if, even if you cannot run around, just do something similar to what you did do just to have fun doing it, all right? But, but what I also am concerned with, though, is that there really is not enough resources for men. You know, mm-hmm. we were at just at CMSC, right? I didn't hear one, not one conference going on there or didn't hear of any of it that pertained to men with MS. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. With all that was happening there, why isn't somebody speaking about this important topic? I mean, there's mm-hmm. got to be a way to handle it for the mental anxiety that we are living with. As Tyler was saying earlier that you were talking about, there just needs to be more discussion on this from the medical community to make it stand out further. Absolutely. And CMSC is a consortium of MS centers, which is a a large um, meeting with uh, physicians, people living with MS, physical therapists. It's it's a big multidisciplinary meeting that happens every year um, that just was in Denver. Um, Stephen, what what would you say for healthcare providers, right? You know, so we know that um, many people with MS are taken care of in the community um, by general neurologists, maybe not specialists. What would you say to our colleagues who are taking care of men in the community about better addressing issues yeah. related to men in MS? A bunch of things. I mean, I think we said at the beginning that being male with MS does worry me a little bit about someone's prognosis. And so it may have implications for how we treat the disease, how aggressively to treat it. So Stuart, you spoke about your treatment journey, getting your treatment escalated to where it needed to be. And nowadays we try to use more powerful medicines earlier. And if we have reasons to be concerned about someone, they should at least know about the more powerful, more highly effective medicines that we have. And if, you know, someone in the community doesn't feel comfortable using those or prescribing those, I respect that. That's what MS centers are for. So that's somebody that could perhaps be seen at an MS center. And if they're in a geography where that's not easy, a lot of MS centers have people who do video visits, telehealth visits like this. So for a a while there, I I saw all of my new patients on video and we can still do that. So, you know, there's opportunities, I think, to connect someone with MS, a man with MS to providers who can meet their disease where it is. I want to make one other point, though, about the kind of emotional aspects of getting this diagnosis. And and it's going to be a little different than what both of you guys said. Just I'll put it out there and see what you see what you guys think. You know, Tyler, Stuart, both of you took having this diagnosis, owned it, made it a part of your identity, put it out there into the world. You obviously are very comfortable in your own skin. You can talk about it publicly. You run programs. You run uh, news platforms, et cetera. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the way that somebody handles getting a diagnosis like MS. Someone could decide to be really quiet about it and still be handling it well. That is to say, for some people, getting a diagnosis like MS becomes a big part of their identity. For other people, it can be a small part of their identity. And I kind of lay that out there for someone, a man being diagnosed with MS to say, listen, if we do things right, this can be the least interesting thing about you. Um, You know, you can go on and do all your stuff. It doesn't have to change your identity if you don't want it to. And to give someone that opportunity to just kind of put it in a box, make sure it's being treated, make sure it's being handled But if keeping it in that box is what they need psychologically to be their full self, I I try to give them that option too. Mm -hmm. It's great. I love it. it. It's great. I love it. So kind of as we're winding up, parting thoughts, are there things that you all are excited about um, that are happening in the advocacy community, the MS community that will help men out there? I'll start with you, Dr. Krieger. Uh, You know, we did not have any meetings that were focused on men and MS. Is there any research that's going on that you know of about men with MS? You know, it's a great question. And Stuart, as you were saying it about how the CMSC conference didn't have any sections on that, I thought maybe we should have a section on that next year. (laughs) Sounds like a project. I think Dr. Williams and I 
we could take <laughs> this and put it on that stage. I, I, I think mean, the four of us should be on this project. Uh, we could we could do it. You know, uh, a couple of years ago now, Dr. Williams, you were guest editing an issue of Practical Neurology, which I is was. a journal for doctors, for neurologists and clinicians. Um, and you came to me and you said, Stephen, I, I want you to contribute a piece to this journal. The, the, the special themed issue was underrepresented people with MS. And I was like, wow, it's such an honor. Dr. Williams wants me to write something about underrepresented minority populations. I was like, sure, what what population would you like me to write about? And you said, men. Exactly. I, figure I want you to write about men. And That's so that good. was an underrepresented population that I felt like maybe I could say something about. And it was a good article. It was a good article. But so you focused on it in the work that you've put out there into the world. I think that we do need more of a focus on that um, for providers, for, for for people living with MS. I think you've done it here on this platform and uh, and maybe we should take it to the main stage at CMSC next year. I think we That's should. That's correct. All right, Tyler and Stuart, tell the people what you guys are up to. Tell the people where to find you because you guys are doing some amazing work. We'll start with Tyler. We'll go to Stuart. Yeah, um, I think I'll put my, you know, you can always follow me at, at TC Speaks 32 on all your social media platforms. Um, I think for me personally, what I get excited about is the younger generation Mm. Um, because there's a generation of people who don't take no for an answer. Um, There's a generation of people who come up who are very strong willed. um, And I think that kind of gets glossed over a lot. And what I'm saying with that means that more approaches, more questions, uh, more conversations and that leads for greater levels of awareness. And so for me, I think that's what I get excited about. Now, on top of that, it also means that a lot of people are getting diagnosed younger, Mm -hmm. but they are getting diagnosed in a lot of cases, maybe even faster. Um, But at the same time, I'm trying to keep people lifted. And what encourages me is when I see young people in their fight, in their willingness, because they come from another generation, those are things that keep this gray-headed young man excited about my battle with MS. Awesome. And you have a book. Tell us about your book. Oh, man. I, you know, Missy. Like, that's not a big deal. Tell us uh, about it. Book, I have a book called The Ball Came Out, Life from the Other Side of the Field. Uh, it was on the best uh, Amazon bestsellers list for 15 straight weeks, which was a awesome. blessing last year. Um, but just documenting my story and just kind of talking over a lot of things we discussed now. And, uh, yeah, just thankful. Thankful. Stuart, tell us what you got going on, man. You're well, busy. Well, firstly, I would love to be able to write a book, but every time I find a ghostwriter that says, let's get together, I don't have time because I'm too busy being on the road doing programs. Then there's All right? that. So it's, it's very tough. So where can people find me? msviewsandnews.org, um, or maybe you could still find me from Stu's Views and MS News. Uh, we are um, the leading MS organization, providing educational programs virtually as well as in person. In fact, um, you know, we are doing so much in rural and underserved communities these days that, you know, we're doing like 50 programs on the road, another 60 to 70 virtually per year. Last year, we closed out 112 programs. Last year, I was on the road 170 nights. And this year, I'll be on the road pretty much the same thing. Yes, it's tiring. But it's also extremely empowering to know that, you know, um, Tyler's talking about, you know, hitting on the younger audience. And for me, it's anybody that's breathing, speaking and listening that we um, that we need to get the message about and get and rate and raise more awareness. And your program tonight, that's fabulous. Okay, we need to do more of this. What Dr. Krieger is talking about and what I mentioned earlier about CMSC, this needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed in a Mm -hmm. larger uh, it, uh, a larger arena than just you know the two of you and the two and and the two of us as patients behind this. We really need to set the stage on this and bring it forward so that way more men can come out of the closet, so to speak, and express their feelings and be able to talk about what's bothering them that they're right now holding hostage in their thoughts. 
Absolutely. Well, listen, this has been action packed and I am so excited, um, especially because, you know, a lot of times when we have these programs, even though I treat a lot of people with MS, I get to listen. Right. And I always learn, um, especially from you, Tyler, and from you, Stuart, and even from you, Dr. Krieger. I always learn something new. So, you know, thank you all for taking the time out tonight to encourage um, others. I know that, uh, you know, there will hopefully be many men who will see this or hear this and be able to, you know, be empowered to talk about their diagnosis and the issues that they're having. Um, and we just, I'm just so grateful. Um, we also want to thank our sponsors, the MS Society, uh, for partnering with us. And we're also uh, very grateful for the Joy Life Foundation, uh, which, uh, you know, is a sponsor for this. And we're getting ready for our big event at the Apollo Theater in New York City on June 24th. Dr. Krieger will be there. We will be having a good time at the Apollo. Um, and I hope that those who are in the New York area can join us. So everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining Brain Chat, and we'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you.